What's up, you guys? I'm Michael Elefante. And I'm Elliot Caldwell, and we're your host for the Social Wealth Podcast, where we'll be talking about all things social media, investment strategies, financial freedom, and how to monetize your personal brand. You'll be getting the inside scoop as we interview some of the top social media influencers, business owners, and investors from around the world. Be sure to follow us on social media at The Social Wealth Podcast. And be sure to like this video and subscribe so you don't miss a future episode. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get started. Austin Hankwitz, what's going on, man? How's it going? Thanks for having me. I'm pumped for this. Yeah, we're super stoked to have you on. We got Michael and Elliot over here early on in our podcast here. You're one of our very first guests. So super stoked to dive into a variety of topics. Elliot, do you want to... You want to kick it off with maybe maybe a first question for Austin? and Absolutely. Austin, nice to meet you. You as well, Elliot. Would you think it'd be beneficial if I maybe gave a quick little 45-second synopsis of who I am? That'd be yeah, perfect. Go for it. Dive yeah. in. So everyone listening, how's it going? My name's Austin Hankwitz. I'm 26 years old. I live in Nashville, Tennessee. And as of March of 2021, I've been a full-time content creator, mainly on TikTok. And I make posts about personal finance and investing, right? So that sort of stemmed from during the pandemic, everyone went home to go lip sync and dance on video on TikTok. I went home to talk about my stock portfolio and trying to build my credit score. And for whatever reason, people really appreciated that, which I appreciate that they appreciated that because it then kind of gave me this cool launch pad to host a community on a, a platform called Patreon. And through the monetary support of that, I was able to quit my job. I was doing mergers and acquisitions for a publicly traded healthcare company for about three years before that. Um, I got a degree in finance and economics from the University of Tennessee back in 2018. But yeah, I was able to quit my job and, and now I'm a full-time content creator, which kind of has like this really cool, like. I built like the seven figure creator business around the marketing side of things, right? Providing outsized impact to companies I believe in, then also consulting, right? So I do a lot of consulting for publicly traded companies, several companies that are backed by awesome, you know, VCs like Y Combinator or Atomic or Pair Ventures and Forerunner and things of that nature. But yeah, we'll get into all that fun stuff, but that's who I am. I create content and the, the way I make money as a content creator is consulting and, you know, sharing the sponsored posts and, and things of that nature. Oh, I also have a Substack newsletter. So people subscribe to that as well. And uh, that's pretty fun. That's a great, great background. When you first started posting content, did you first see yourself, was the goal to be a full-time content creator or were you just kind of dabbling in, just sharing what you're like, you're learning every single day at your day job or anything like that? Like give us, give us the idea or the thing that kind of prompted you to post that first video. Yeah. So I've always, so I guess like more about that is I had Dave Ramsey, well, not Dave Ramsey. I had Dave Ramsey come to my high school when I was, I don't know, probably 15 or 16 years old. So Dave Ramsey's based here in Franklin, Tennessee, right? I went to high school over in Kingsport, Tennessee. And I don't know if y'all knew this, but Tennessee per capita is the number one state in the country for bankruptcy, right? And so Dave Ramsey's like, well, I'm here in Tennessee. See, that can't be the case. I should go teach people to not be bankrupt, right? So he went and did like this like state statewide tour to high schools and came to my high school talking about this Roth IRA stuff, investing, whatever. I'm like, this is dope. I want to learn more about it. And ever since then, so call it maybe like, I don't know, 2000. 13, 2014, uh, even I was really just interested in investing and the stock market and finance in general, which is why I got the, my, no, my, my degree. But after I graduated, like I had always told myself that I wanted to be like Graham Stephan and Andre Jick, one of those sort of online personalities. And I never knew really when to take the leap, right? I was always kind of like, worried about what other people might think about me or, you know, how much time is this going to take? Do I have that time? Do I have the energy? Do I have the knowledge or even the specific knowledge? Do people care what I have to say? And so funny enough to your question of like, you know, did you do this on purpose? I actually had to ask my girlfriend at the time if it was okay if I posted on TikTok because this was kind of like before the pandemic really made it cool to post on TikTok. And I was like, TikTok could be a super easy way for me to just like share people what's good. Like kind of like you do like a Snapchat story, right? You just kind of pull up your phone, talk about some shit and click post. TikTok's really unique and they, you know, you can do that as well. And so I was like, yo, is it a post on TikTok? It's not like, it's, it's kind of weird to do, right? At least at the time it was, now it's awesome. But yeah, I made the post and I didn't really have any ex expectations. I actually didn't check it for like four days. And then I come back and it's at 1.2 million views, hundreds of thousands. Your of first video. Content. First video, video number one. Yeah. Wow. Thousands of comments, thousands of shares. And I was like, yo, this is awesome. I'm going to start doing this. Well, what's the first video? So the first video, it 
was published on St. Patrick's Day. So March 17, I believe, of 2020. The markets had just tanked like crazy. It was one of those seven or eight percent days, right? And I was like, hey everyone, like here's my stock portfolio. It looks really red right now, but that's fine because I'm only 24 years old. I'm dollar cost averaging. I really encourage you guys to, you know, buy the dip continue to you know like invest toward the long term things of that nature just very broad but like pretty normal kind of like motivational speak around investing and I, I just showed people a couple of my favorite ETFs and I think that's what really helped it you know go viral I think what's interesting about posting content Elliot and Michael is that if it's actionable people really really t- tend to like it and want to share it right so like if I'm sharing something and I'm saying hey here's the specific ETFs I'm buying or this is the specific website I use to do ABC XYZ it's like oh shit this is cool like like let me uh let me check this out I want to actually do this right and so I think that I know just I just learned that over the several years of posting content but yeah that was I think was probably one of the main drivers the main catalyst for that rest is history man it was really really cool experience yeah that's awesome so walk us through when you first were able to monetize social media and did you know what that first step would look like for you because like you said earlier in the intro there's several different ways that people can monetize through platforms like TikTok or instagram or youtube it can be very different too platform to platform so did you one did you know what strategy you were going to start with and then two like what was the time frame and how long did it take for you to kind of enter the monetization of social media so I knew immediately, and I think you understand this too, Michael. It's like a lot of creators' game plan off day one is to make a couple of videos, get some followers, and then sponsor post. Right? That's like the that's the, that's the game plan everyone uses. But I had sort of wanted to build a business, an underlying business around this, versus rely on advertisers to pay me money to to be able to like you know move forward with with this business. And so. To that point, Andre Jick actually inspired me to open up a Patreon account. His Patreon, I think, was like you could support it for four dollars or eight dollars, and you get like a live stream once a month, or like you know this or you know exclusive content. Right? People pay for that access, and I was like, this is a really good idea. Let me offer uh, a weekly live stream. Let me offer three or four posts a week to this place. Let me offer even a way to track my portfolio investments, things of that nature, and people ate it up. Right. So much so that I was able to offer, I think, three or four different tiers at the time. It was like four dollars because here's the thing, man. I don't think that content creators are empathetic enough to the fact that I would actually love y'all's perspective on this. But I mean, I can only name a handful of creators that I would actually want to give money to. Like before, like not even friends with in real life, like like maybe written link from, you know, Good Mythical Morning or like Philip DeFranco, maybe because like I've been watching him for 10 years. But like I can name like just a couple of people that I'd actually want to like monetarily support. And so to come from the perspective as a creator and say, hey guys, give me money, support my work, like this, this and that, like that's great, that's awesome. But like, you need to be really empathetic to how much you're like trying to charge. And I think, uh, you know, what, what Gary V has has done a really good job of is is sharing with people to be able to do this in a way that's that's meaningful, you need to provide immense value in relation to how much you're charging, right? So for example, I had this tier that was one, it was it was four bucks and it was like, buy me a beer. Those are for the people that really didn't care. They just want to say, here's four bucks, Austin, we love you. But the, the other one was $8. And for $8, you would get like the live stream, the portfolios, the four, four or five posts, you can DM me, like you can do all this stuff. And I did it at a price point where someone didn't have to say Austin Hankwitz or my Netflix subscription or Austin Hankwitz or Spotify. It's like, it's at a price where I thought that they, they could do both, right? So I, I think, you know, as a creator trying to monetize, if you're listening right now, like definitely be cognizant and empathetic to the, you know, how much value you're providing up front for the audience, but also like the price point. I think that's like the, the just really, really uh, want to, you know, nail that in for sure. But yeah, no, I was all in on figuring out how to monetize early on. If it was Patreon, and then I I realized that the next way of monetizing for me was sponsored posts, right? So I was able to begin doing that at scale. And I think what a lot of creators make the mistake of doing is they say, all right, who wants me? What, you know, what, what's going on? How could I, you know, who, who wants to pay me money? Where in actuality, what I did is I looked inside and I said, well, what what apps am I using on my phone? What specific fintech apps? Is it Betterment? Is it Wealthfront? Is it Robinhood? Is it public? Like what apps am I using? And are these people advertising online? And and if not, like, okay, maybe I don't go after them, but you know, 99% of the time they were, how do I find them on LinkedIn? How do I you know show them, hey, I've got 42,000 followers. Like here's, you know, I talked about you twice in this video. I'd love you know, to, to work out a relationship, right? And I think creators do a bad job of flip-flopping back and forth from like one advertiser to another, to this, to that. 
And I mean, honestly, you get like one, maybe two times where you can really flip and uh, that's it. Then your audience is like, what are you doing, man? This doesn't make any sense. So then I was able to identify, call it seven or eight companies that really, really liked what I uh, had to say. And I really aligned with their values and their mission and their product was able to, um, you know, build out these 12, 18 month contracts and work toward getting equity in their businesses as well. Public.com is a good example of that. And then from the consulting side, so I think what happened was 2021 was a good year of like building those long-term you know, businesses. And then 2022 was a good year of really beginning to build that consulting business, right? At this point, I think you would agree, Michael, I think you do as well. We have specific knowledge with what might do well on the internet, what might not do well on TikTok or what people really care about. Where a lot of people who work at these companies, you know, they don't really know that, right? Maybe they have a social media manager but like their social media manager is not a creator like they kind of like it's, it's one thing to like know what's going on it's another thing to actually do it and like get reps in right and so from that perspective we've uh, when i say we christian blackwell and i as my co-founder we've been able to uh, build out a, a meaningful book of business from our consulting uh, kind of arm in our uh, in our company and that's the whole monetization book man i think over the last call it two years we've we've accumulated 1.5 to 1.8 million in revenue for the business and it's been incredible it's been a lot of fun what was it from your W-2 job where you finally took that leap of faith to leave that to do what you're doing now? This is my favorite question because I loved my job. I loved my boss. I loved my CEO. I loved the work I was doing. I genuinely didn't want to quit. Full transparency, I was making $70,000 a year at Emeticis, the company I worked for as this M&A analyst back in 2019, right? 2020. And I, I, that's a lot of money for a, a 23 year old make. I was hype. But then when I started realizing, wait, I was able to build this business and now it just paid me $33,000 this month, 10 times more than I'll take home after taxes and 401k contributions or whatever than it did over here. Like I should pursue this. Like this seems like a one. And I talked to my boss about it. I was like, man, like I'm really thinking about quitting to do this. What do you think? And he's like, well, how much are you making? And I told him, he's like, dude, I would have quit like three months ago. <laughs> the one in a lifetime opportunity. Like you should squeeze this for everything it's worth. And so, I mean, the the, the plain answer is I was making 10 times more money. I mean, that, that's just what it was. And, and to see that and be like, okay, I mean, it was really scary, right? But to see that and say, okay, like I can do this. And if I'm able to build horizontally, find those long-term partners, you know, build out that book of business for the consulting arm, everything's going to be okay. Yeah. I think you can contest to this, but something I've noticed with social media is things grow really quickly at, at scale compound very, very quickly as well. So as long as you have that value-based approach and you're still accumulating followers and, and trust with those followers, you can kind of branch out and do several different things or build several different businesses that underlie your content and it's it can be exponential growth you're not locked into a salary or that hourly you know rate that you get paid each week or each month so that's that's pretty cool to hear that it grew so so quickly for you i would agree with you on that and just want to dive a little bit deeper like i think a lot of creators and maybe you notice this yourself too michael it's like there's a lot of people that want to like i want a million followers i want two million followers or three million but then it's like you look at their likes or views or engagement and they're in there you know they have a lot of followers but they don't have a community right and so like from day one i really made sure to begin fostering that community if it was on patreon or a sub stack or whatever that you know external place was off the platform people who really wanted to be there really want to engage with what i had to say and what i was doing I think that's incredibly important for anyone listening right now that's that's trying to figure out do i want to be a creator how do i monetize this like what's my next step foster a community incredibly important right go deep don't yeah go wide. that's a great point one other question i had for you was i think i remember when you first reached out to me because i lived in nashville at the time too and you said hey you want to grab lunch i was like yeah like i would love to I saw you were crushing it on tiktok i had just started posting on tiktok i think at that point in time so i don't know what made you want to reach out to me because i was like a little bug under your shoe i think content wise which is cool so i was like this austin hangos this is great i've seen your videos before we met and you were telling me how you kind of had a boots on the ground approach to patreon and growing it yourself which fascinated me and that's a lot of hard work can you just tell the audience how and i think a lot of other content creators or aspiring content creators can can learn a lot from this and not just expect everybody to go to your link in bio and trust what's there type of thing. But you you kind of build some rapport with your audience, whether it was on TikTok or, or on Instagram. Can you talk about that approach that you had to grow Patreon -ish initially? Yeah, 100%. So generally speaking, I realized that, and we all know this as creators, right? You can go say, go check out the link in my bio. And like, you might get 100,000 views on the video and you might get 100 people to click on the link in your bio. It just doesn't just doesn't happen unless you know you're sharing something really important. So what I did to circumvent this is I actually took a page out of Gary Vee's book. I think he said this back in like 20, 
2017 or 2016, he was like telling a guy that worked at a barbershop or owned his own barbershop how to get more clients. And he's like, you want to just like find someone's location here in New York City. And then like, if they have a cool picture, like like it or something, but then shoot him a DM, be like, yo, I'm here in New York. I'm a barber. Like, come check me out. And I was like, oh shit, like shooting DMs. I didn't think about that. I was like, wait, I answer all of my DMs. Now it's all just full of you know, bullshit. I don't think the strategy works much anymore, but I just have like NFTs in my Twitter DMs and like all other bullshit in my DMs. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't exactly work as powerful as it was two or three years ago, but yeah. I, so every single person that followed me, I'd follow them back. I'd like a post or two and I'd shoot them a DM that was personalized. Hey, Catherine, love the new car. Red's my favorite color. Who would have thought? By the way, I don't know if you knew this or not, but I have a Patreon account. And over here, I post about ABC XYZ. Here's a post for you. It's completely free to read and it's free to sign up. But if you want to support my work or be, you know, get XYZ different perks, that's eight bucks a month. Like, you know, just go learn more about it. Open rates were nearly a hundred percent. Click through rates were close to 25, 30%. And I mean, like that's how I went from zero to 1700 supporters, patrons, right? On my Patreon. And all those people were sort of the backbone now for my, my sub stack. There's like 8,700 of us over there that are hanging out. But to that point, like thinking through the idea of how powerful community is, 55% open rates on every email I send to these people, right? Like that's pretty crazy uh, considering I, I, I look over at the morning brew or average Joe or market this or market that. They're like, yeah, we got 22% open rates or 33% open rates. So like they brag about it. But you know, that's, I just, people that want to be there will open and read your stuff. And I think like these, at, at the end of the day, if you're a content creator and you're able to do this boots on the ground marketing, like they'll remember you as the guy that sent them a DM on Instagram, complimented their car, said red was your favorite color, and they're just going to fuck with you for the rest of their life. Like it's just, it's like a weird kind of way that it comes together. Sorry, am I not extract, am I allowed to cast here? Is that cool? Yeah, yeah that's fine. <laughs> All right, sweet. That's awesome, man. I love that strategy. Can you, if you're comfortable talking about it, can you share the different streams of income that you have developed up until this point in time? Um, and if you're comfortable also sharing like maybe from top to bottom, like what you make with each one. I'd be really curious. I think a lot of people out there, especially again, aspiring content creators or entrepreneurs would be really curious. Like they hear Patreon, but what about all your other investments? Like break down like the income based investments or businesses and then the equity as well with some of these companies that you were referring to earlier. hundred percent. So like, let me pull up a Google sheet real fast. I think that might help. Okay. So let's talk about advertising. All right. So yeah, we're doing ads for uh, companies like Fundrise, companies like Republic. Uh, they are really cool. First, Fundrise is amazing. If you, I think you're very familiar with Fundrise. Long story short, their um, you know, investment platform that allows you to invest into real estate. Companies like Republic.com, they are a platform that allows you to invest in privately held companies. I believe you don't have to be accredited to uh, invest with them. Uh, Fifth Third Bank, uh, they had a really cool credit card that came out with 5% cash back on your uh, what's it called? Your gas. And so that I did an ad for them doing a lot of UGC content. So public.com, uh, for example, I pretty much run their TikTok for them. Uh, I did a lot of UGC. And, and for y'all that don't know what that means, it's like making a video about something cool and then posting it on behalf of the advertiser, posting it on behalf of the, the company's account, not your own account. Right. And so I'd say like between on a monthly basis, like advertiser revenue between call it like four or five different companies, which includes UGC, it's probably hovering around like the 35 to 45 range, depending on like if I negotiate a good deal. For example, United Health Group hit me up two months ago to help them educate people about the different scary terms that are, you know, that come with open enrollment. Like what's a deductible? How does this money work? Right. I'm the money man. Let me tell you about it. And they paid me like $8,000. It was awesome. So like if I'm able to negotiate a really cool contract with them or, you know, other cool companies that, that come my way, then that kind of hits the upper threshold. But if I'm not, it's just kind of like a normal month with like the locked in, you know, advertisers, it's probably close to that 30, 35 range. And then, so that's one point. So the advertiser consulting is right now coming in around 70, 75,000. That's across three different entities and the work just varies, right? Sometimes it's helping them build their social media presence from scratch. Maybe it's helping them build a larger idea of, you know, a content 
and creators and, and this other stuff too. It's like, there's, I feel like a couple like NDA nuances I don't want to get too deep into like what they're working on. But generally speaking, the consulting is very specific knowledge as it relates to building a presence online, garnering the attention of other creators to want to help amplify your presence, as well as really beginning to drive that organic volume toward the websites or any other types of uh, products or services that they might sell. That I feel like that's pretty high level, but also specific enough where your listeners probably understand. So yeah, that's like 70-ish thousand a month. And then any other crazy 70 grand a year, folks, to 70K a month as one. Dude, is that isn't that crazy? Like, crazy. Like I, I reflect back on like, here, let me see if I can. You kind of just view money differently. And it might sound like so far-fetched if you're a listener and you're just like, you can't fathom it. But like, I remember thinking several years ago, I was like, if I could only make 70K a year, like I would be bawling, you know? And so now this sounds bad, but if I was like, man, if I'm making 70K a year, like now I'm like, I don't, I don't know. It's just, it's like a different viewpoint, vantage point, I guess you could say just looking back, but that's so cool, man. I'm, I'm so happy for you and all the things you've grown, but I didn't mean to interrupt because I know there's more. No, no, I appreciate it. And I think what's, you know, back to that point too, of like thinking through the actual like numbers and just reflecting on that, like, I just really encourage everyone and I would hear like, you know, these online person that I was like, escape the matrix or like do this or do that. Like, I think that's like a bullshit way to think about it. But like, I really do think once you have specific knowledge and you figure out how to amplify and compound that knowledge by using technology, AKA social media or code or like a product or something like it is game over. And you can, you can replicate that model across as many different ways as possible that you want. But like, once you figure it out, you just, you just get it. I don't know how to explain it. And anyone listening right now, shoot me a DM on Instagram or Twitter or TikTok, and I'd be happy to you know, share more of my experience of, of doing that, but to reflect, right? Like January of 2021. So I'd not yet quit my job, but I'd, you know, almost was it now eight or nine months into creating content. Patreon was rolling. I was excited. I was actually really beginning to like, okay, I can quit. This is getting something excited. I made $17,000, 10,000 or I'm sorry, let me actually get you the real amount of how much came from Patreon. I was all Patreon. Yeah. Seven, all 17,000 came from Patreon. I had like a $46 payout from the TikTok creator fund. But that's good to show, like having a community that really wants to support you and show you that you can, you know, provide value to at scale, like they're willing to pay for that. Like that's $17,000. That's crazy, right? And then you start getting into, um, let me see, I, I did a $2,000 ad in the month of February. I did a $6,600 affiliate marketing thing the month of February and I went from 17,000 to 30,400 that next month. And then like I went from making like 17 to 30 to 38 to 55. I had a bad month at 35, then 61 <laughs> and then 65. And then in 2022, I think our, our worst month for revenue was, and this, is all, this is all revenue, right? I, I From this, I have to pay employees. I've got to pay salaries. I have to pay insurances, cars. Like This, this is all revenue. But yeah, the worst month I think was in the month of May at 46,000. And the best was March at 176,000. And it's just like, you know, it's it's just crazy, man. It is crazy. It's crazy. Like once you figure out how to build a business and cultivate, like just you build, it took us, I mean, you know, Christian, it, it took us a long time to build horizontally, but once we kind of laid that foundation, we just started pulling those levers and the monetization levers, right? And that's that's kind of what we're doing now. What does your team look like, Austin? So I was super, super lucky to meet a guy named Christian Blackwell, who's a 24-year-old, turns 25 in about six weeks, four weeks, early January, mid-January. He went to UVA. He did pricing and profitability for PwC, management consulting in New York. He's a grinder. Dude's a grinder. He's savage. He's a really good negotiator. He has every single, and so like if you're trying to find a co-founder or someone to build with you, like I cannot emphasize this enough, figure out what you're good at and figure out what you're fat at. I'm a really bad organizational person. I'm really bad at, at kind of operationalizing ideas. I'm really good at coming up with ideas. I'm good at like being like this, you know, this person and like trying to like figure things out. But like Christian is the opposite of me in a good way, right? He's really good at, you know, specifically laying out tasks and projects and like operationalizing different types of milestones and, and the things that we want to do. And so, uh, yeah, so it's me and Christian, co-founders of, of Wits Ventures, Hank Wits Group, whatever you want to call us here. And uh, so that's like the, the that's, that's the two of us there. And then underneath we've got one, two three contract workers 
So we have one person that reposts all my content. They help us kind of organize a bunch of different projects we kind of have going on. So that's that's one. Number two is a video editor. They're always, you know, we, it kind of like the the retainers where you can kind of like, hey, I'll just keep paying you a little bit of money. Like if we, if we need something, I need it in 24 hours, but like you're our boy, right? She's like, all right, cool, cool. So we've got that. And then someone else that helps us ghostwrite actually. So I want to really start figuring out how to get bigger on Twitter. And so I paid this guy named Andrew who went from like 20,000 to 80,000 followers on Twitter by like coming up with these Twitter threads. So he's like ghostwritten all these Twitter threads for me. And I'm like, dude, this is great. So I haven't posted any of them yet, but I really want to figure out how to do that and like try like add my little twist on them because I don't know shit about Twitter, unfortunately. Um, but with Elon Musk now owning it, I feel like I need to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Just a piece of advice, someone that's been doing some of my social media content for me is re and you probably will do this or already doing it, but reposting those Twitter threads to Instagram as like slides, the engagement is phenomenal. And then having some type of call to action if there if one is necessary right with with, with what the post is, entails but my engagement rate and like fifteen thousand new followers in two weeks type of engagement yeah it's crazy on instagram which uh, instagram i didn't really figure out until recently it took me a while like TikTok, i felt like you can kind of like comes in waves right you have a video or two and you get boom like thirty thousand new followers like instagram's tougher and I, twitter i'm still figuring out but if you figure that out just repost it and i feel like that those really do well on Instagram for whatever reason. One thing I think, <clears throat> oh, go ahead. I was, no, you're good, man. Twitter specifically was, um, yeah, I've been hosting these Twitter spaces, uh, the audio events, you know, and I've got like 30 to 40 followers every time I host one. So maybe we host one together. That'd be fun. Yeah, man. I'm always game for that. I wonder, is Clubhouse still a thing? I know Gary Vee was like, that was a big thing. I think he was just a big investor in Clubhouse. That's probably why he was promoting it, but I, th I think Clubhouse is going to die. Yeah, I'm, I haven't used it, nor have I seen anyone use it or talk about it since like, I don't know how long ago yeah. it was probably, what was that like? Uh, it, was hot, it was hot at first. It was like early 2021. Everyone was like, yeah, Clubhouse, it's like being in the boardroom. I'm like, no, it's like being in the boardroom. Like you're bored. Like <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not fun. But that's just my opinion. Some people probably love it. I guess like a live podcast. I don't know. Who knows? But one thing I think you've done extraordinarily well, Austin, I really admire about you and something I personally need to really work on is, dude, you build tremendous relationships. I feel like every time I talk to you, you're like, hey, have you have you met this person yet or with this company? I'm like, no, like, what do they do? And you're like, yeah, I'll bridge the relationship. Here you go. And then you just connect me with someone, man. It's like, there's always someone new. And I, I think that's, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's helped fuel some of your growth like tremendously. And then you're you're building that network has also kind of you've fostered relationships relationships where you could also invest in the company or get equity in a company especially as it's like a younger company right which i think is going to be extremely fruitful for you long term do you have any tips for people as far as just like establishing like a good network relationship like what what do you typically do if you're reaching out to a, a, just an individual or a company and you don't know who to reach out to within the company yeah so i think like i'll address the, i don't know, i appreciate the kind words man i'll address the first one so i think like unfortunately a lot of creators think that it's a zero-sum game right oh i gotta have this i gotta have this brand i gotta be doing this like it's it's taking money from me if this creator who creates content like I do like it's just, no dude get the fuck out no we're all trying to move in up and to the right right and so for us to do that I can't make good real estate content because I don't own a lot of real estate but you do and so if I know a company that is working in real estate and I like do a little something but I think like it's it's an overlap I'm gonna make the intro right not only is that providing value to you but it provides value to the company because I know you're a great creator and so like at the end of the day it's it's not a zero sum game and we can all help each other. And I, I, I agree, like some of my best opportunities and the crazy things that have happened over the last, call it 24 months, have come from just being that guy that always says yes and is always open to trying to help someone else do something cooler than myself. Cause I know that I only have so much bandwidth and so many cool ideas. I, like I know my strengths and I know other people's strengths. And if I can help someone, you know, lean into their strengths, I'll definitely do that. So the idea of like building a network and how do I, well, now it's easy. I'm verified. I just DM one, you know, and they, they get back to me. But before, you know what I think is really underrated is a good cold email. I had a company, do you, do you know, John, yeah, you know, John who? Yeah. So 
he taught me the power of a cold email and I didn't realize how powerful they could be until you really know how to do one. And I've, I've leveraged this a couple times uh, and I'm still trying to do it now with uh, a different business I'm working with and I'll, we'll get into that. So John, who, for those who are listening, he's the co-founder and CEO of Stan, stan.store. It's the link and bio solution. Think about like Shopify, but for content creators, like a click funnels rather for content creators, like just a very cool, like simple, easy way to open up a business and sell digital products and you know, things of that nature. He's doing two or $3 million in annual recurring revenue now, just 24 months in. He was backed by a forerunner and some of the biggest and most reputable VCs. And the guy's a rock star, graduated from Stanford. I can go on and on about him, one of my best friends. And he showed me, he's like, yeah, man, got this idea. And uh, for this you know, company, whatever, like, dude, this is cool. Like, let me know if I can help. He's like, all right. And he's like, yo, guess what? I'm like, what? He's like, Mark Cuban got back to me. He wants to be in on it. And I was like, how did you get Mark Cuban to like even listen to you? What are you talking about? He's like, oh, I sent him a cold email. And I'm like, can I see what you said? Because that makes sense. Mark Cuban an email. That's hilarious. Yeah. I was like, what, what are you talking about? And so what he did was he like named one of his favorite players on the Dallas Mavericks, like in the subject line, thinking it might catch the guy's attention. And then talked about like, literally it's like three bullet points. It's like, my company does this, this is this, ABC, XYZ, and like how you can benefit from it. And like, what do you think? What like, and it worked. And the guy's like, this is really cool. Tell me more about this. Like send it, you know, send me the deck, whatever. I, I think you might be on the cap table. Don't hold me to that. But like just getting an answer from Mark Cuban, I think was a, a cool thing from a cold email perspective. And so I I really, really think that if you're listening and you're trying to build out that network or just don't, rest, don't underestimate the power of a good cold email. And, and it's always about providing value up front. Show people like what you're about. Put yourself out there, but don't be, you know, be too aggressive, right? If they, if they don't come back to you after, you know, you can bump it once, maybe twice. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it when people connect with me on LinkedIn and they just keep like, hey, did you see my message? Did you see my, like, dude, get out of here. No, I didn't, you know. So bump it once, maybe twice if you're ballsy and it makes sense too, but like, don't keep pestering them. But if it's a good cold email, they might get back to you. Mark Cuban's emails are about to be blown up tomorrow. <laughs> hey, you mentioned real estate. Obviously, Michael and I love investing in real estate. What real estate investments have you done or planned to do? Not enough, man. I I don't have enough. So I bought my first property October of 2019. So I would have been 23 years old. What kind of property uh, was that? It is a town home here in Nolensville, Tennessee, three bedroom, two and a half bath. It was built brand new in 2019, paid $279,900 for it, but 3% down. Got my closing costs paid for by the builder and like 1% off of like something else. I don't, I don't, I mean, it was close. I don't know. I got a really good deal is what it was. And I was like, sign me up. This is cool. So, I mean, I was making $70,000 before, I mean, before that, like, but when I quit my job, I was making 70. When I signed out of medicine, it was $62,500, right? And so living in Nashville, all your buddies are wanting to go drink and go to this concert, go do that and that. And I'd realized like, nah, fuck that. I'm trying to build a business. I'm trying to build me. I want to build wealth. Like, I'm going to stay home, save my money, ABC, XYZ, pay off my debt. And so because I skipped the concert, because I didn't go to the bars, because I didn't do these things that I don't regret, but certainly would have had a lot of fun doing, I was able to scrape together over an 18 month period, $10,455 to be the total cash down needed to buy the house I'm sitting in right now for 279000 This house is now worth, assuming the two comps that have sold in the last six months around me are real, you know, actual comps going forward over $400,000, right? So I was able to take this $10,000 investment that a 23 year old who just said no to everything so we could save it and and compound that into more, you know, capital gains if, if I ever sell this place. So during COVID, so my dad's 78 years old, really old guy. Uh, and during COVID, he moved in with me. I'm his primary caretaker. I'm young. I'm able. I got always got time for my dad. He took care of me, you know, my whole life and take care of him in his old age. And so I realized that though over call it, you know, 18 months that we'd been living together that I would love being close to him, but Ireland, my girlfriend, you know, she's moving to Nashville. We just moved here in July and we certainly want to get a place together at some point soon. So what's like that best perfect medium? And so what we decided on was I'm just going to let my dad live in this house. And I bought my neighbor's house because their townhomes are really close to each other. Right. And so uh, I was able to purchase an identical townhome right next door. Uh, back in August, I had paid $410,000 for it. Uh, I put 20% down. Um, unfortunately, because I am not a W-2 worker, I had to get a really unconventional loan. Um, when I say unconventional, I think it was like a- oh, Did you do like a, a bank statement loan? Yeah, bank statement. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And because my business bank account was with my bank of Tennessee, 
they were like, yeah, we'll lend to you. Like we know how much money you have, like all's well. Um, I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. So 6.6% was the interest rate on that. Mm. Not, I mean, it's, it's not the best, not the worst, but you know, I, we can certainly afford it. Ireland can I, Ireland and I can't. And yeah, so that's, that's my current real estate sort of uh, portfolio, if you want to even call it that. But the goal, right? The goal is over the next, call it five to six years, uh, maybe seven or eight, hopefully around the six or seven range. Right. But over the next several years, I plan to invest and grow my dividend growth stock portfolio where I've actually just launched a fund for this on QuantBase. They, uh, QuantBase is a rules-based quantitative hedge fund that allows you to build strategies that you can specifically uh, deploy capital uh, toward. And so I built a strategy that said, I want to invest in only companies that are in the S&P 500, only companies that are paying at least a 3% dividend yield, and only companies who are growing their dividends by more than 10% per year on average over the last five years. And that strategy that, oh, and it rebalances every eight weeks. That strategy has outperformed the stock market, the S&P 500 by 92% over the last 10 years when you back test it. And so, and I, I'll send you a link if you want to, I just put 10 grand into it the other day. So it like, we just launched it. One of those product ideas, we can get more about this as you know, the creator business. So I want to build a dividend growth portfolio over the next several years that allows Ireland and I to live off of 70, 80, 90, hundred thousand dollars in passive dividend income. And then these two houses, hopefully rent them out. Uh, we'll pay them off first, but rent them out. Who knows what that would maybe 40 or maybe four grand a month in cash flow between the two of them, long-term rentals, right? And then take whatever we want to do, however much we're making and say, okay, let's go buy a dream house, right? We're 32, 33, let's go buy that, you know, 800, 900 million dollar house somewhere in Brentwood or somewhere in Franklin and really, really enjoy. That's that's like the the good eight year goal. I keep adding years to it because I don't think I'm going to hit it, but that's that's the goal. That's the goal. Yeah. It'll, the thing about real estate though, man, and Elliot and I can both attest to this is it'll probably be like happen in one or two years for you. Like that things just compound so fast. I mean, it's no different than social media. I mean, a little different, right? So that eight or 10 year goal, that could probably happen in like two years for you. And you'll, we'll probably have you back on the podcast and be like, man, 18 months later, here we are. $2 million house in Brentwood, Tennessee. I've <laughs> yeah, with what you're doing and how much you're creating, like short-term rentals, you could take that extremely, extremely to the next level very quickly. I mean, I wasn't making- Y'all let me know how. I mean, I know I know Michael and I, we talked about short-term rentals uh, about a year ago now, but I mean, that's I'm at that point too, where it's like, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. I don't know anything about short-term rentals, but I do have a couple hundred thousand dollars yeah. and I'm happy to put toward one. I just don't know anything about them. Sounds like after this call, we'll talk about a deal. <laughs> Conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, you were making, you're making way more money than I was in my previous sales job. And we bought our first one March of 2021. So, you know, year and a half coming on two years. And now we have seven and producing probably on average about $50,000 cash flow a month, you know, in all seven. So, it, you know, less than two years to take it to that with less than what you're doing. I mean, you could take it to double that in two years. So, so now let me ask the experts, what do you guys think? So obviously we have like this looming recession, uh, all these other macroeconomic headwinds that are pointing toward bad times ahead. What, I mean, and, and I think we just saw a consumer spending report come out this morning that caused the markets to trade down nearly 3% that people did not spend as much money as they thought they were going to in November, right? So people are like really beginning to not spend money, constrict their wallets. How do you think that might impact Airbnb? How, how are you guys bracing for that impact? What are you all doing? What are you guys projecting for 2023? Like, is there like, like what, what are you guys like kind of saying, like, here's what we're doing to hedge against, you know, bad times ahead. I mean, to take that, I, I got a lot to say, but go ahead. Yeah. Kick it off. Now I think, I mean, it's a market by market approach on that. I mean, we know we have some, we have friends in a certain area of Florida where there are $150,000 in bookings in 2023, you know, so already of 2023, then we have some areas that are down. So it's just market by market approach. From a personal side, you know, me and Michael are continuing to invest. Uh, we put an offer in on a property. We didn't get it like three or four weeks ago, but we're continuing to invest. Now we got, you know, you invest smart. What looms ahead at some point, what goes up, come down, what comes down, comes up. So, I mean, is, is it, is it going to be next year? Is it going to be in 10 years? You know, we don't know. So we continue to invest smart, have a, enough in, in the, in the bank to not only take care of ourselves, but also, you know, now we have 11 employees to provide. In, a, in an economic downturn we, that are A players. And so that that is a different spin that's not, that wasn't there last year that we got to think about too. I mean, I think just getting through COVID, having short-term rentals, especially in a city like Nashville where travel was nada, 
like it was dead. So we had to pivot, right, to midterm stays, maybe to like try and pivot to travel nurses or construction. Like it didn't even matter, but we were still cash flow positive all but two months in Nashville in peak COVID. And so from my perspective, I can't, and I could be wrong, I just can't imagine something happening to the travel and hospitality industry that would impact short-term or vacation rentals like COVID did at least temporarily. But you're right, if consumers spend less and they tighten up their their budget a little bit, but I still think people will, will travel, but it'll probably be less luxurious travel and vacations. Now, the people that do travel, there will still be demand in down markets, but I'm under the impression that if you sell people on the experience and provide a better place to stay in a market, like a Nashville, for example, you will still get booked, albeit maybe at lower rates or daily rates than during like the travel boom that, that we've had the past couple of years. And then the people that kind of go bare bones or that already compete on price are going to struggle. So I think going back to what you said earlier, just with social media, like the value-based approach, that's how we approach short-term rentals is providing a higher value and elevated experience so that we can get premium daily rates and be selected as that property during busy times. And then during slow times, we will get booked when others won't. But I think just having a little bit extra cash in the bank doesn't hurt even per property, at least personally, I have a you know, set amount of money. So like, even if we didn't get booked for three straight months, which... I could not imagine happening. We would still be able to, you know, support the mortgage and expenses and things like that. So, so you guys, and I, I just want to make sure I heard you clearly, Michael. So what you're doing is per property, you set aside like three months worth of like, you know, expenses uh, on that property. And that's kind of like what you have against, I think the eight properties you have now. Yeah. I own six personally. Um, and we have probably about three months of expenses in each of the business accounts associated with each property. And then my wife and I have a decent amount of cash in the bank as well. It's really more of just like, a hedge against anything that could possibly happen and that could affect us personally. So we have that kind of like a rainy day fund, right? But also just having multiple properties that are all leveraged, right? Through mortgages, we do want to be a little bit more cash heavy during an economic downturn. But the flip side of that is also to be more opportunistic too, because what I see is is a fire sale. So if if real estate gets affected, I don't know how it'll be affected. I you know I'm not going to try and have pretend like I have a crystal ball in my pocket and say, this is exactly how real estate's gonna be affected because that's what a lot of people do and half the people are wrong every time. But if you have, if you're prepared financially to take advantage of any type of recession, whether it's stock, real estate, that's where people get extremely wealthy is being prepared to take advantage of that. So I don't know what's gonna happen, but what do you think? I think that the housing market is gonna come to a screeching halt because as interest rates continue to rise, I feel like mortgages are going to hit that eight, nine, ten percent, which I think is going to really price a lot of people out and or force sellers that really need to sell to bring prices down to an equilibrium that allows people to afford those mortgages at those uh, interest rates. I, I also think that with interest rates rising now to a terminal rate of five to five and a half percent, maybe a pivot not going to happen until you know, second half of 2024 from the Fed. I think that it's really going to cause, let's use a little bit of data. So, and I, I, I got to jump in a couple minutes, but I was going to say, so every time inflation has been above, I think five or 6% back to the 1940s, unemployment had to spike above 6% before inflation came down, right? That was like a prerequisite, right? We're at 3.7, right? And there's a lot of, we see the big tech layoffs. We see a lot of these people, you know, who are, you know, we see the headlines. But I also think though, to a point that Dave Ramsey had made, I watch his show, shoot me if you want. But uh, he made a point a couple of days ago about how he's not laying off anybody and his business is fine despite, you know, he's not laying people off despite making less profits this year than he did last year. And so I think, you know, when you balance the publicly traded corporations and having to keep shareholders happy from a SGNA perspective. And you balance that with like small to medium sized businesses, not having shareholders and just saying, okay, we just made less money this year. I don't know. It's going to be an interesting, it's going to be interesting 2023. I think at the you know base case, we might have a soft landing, right? The Fed might be able to pull it off. They might be able to, to really say, we raised rates, we tamed inflation and we completely avoided a recession. I think that that is sort of naive to think, especially as you look at, you know, Wall Street's earnings estimates of like zero growth in 2023 uh, and only 4% in 2024, you know, profits normally grow much faster than that, right? So I think that's just like, like, I think there's a lot of things, a lot of writing on the wall that's pointing to something that could be around the corner. But, you know, I also think that 
it's market to market. I think that, you know, there are companies who are going to continue to do very, very well. There are going to be people who are going to take advantage of those opportunities in real estate and say, yeah, I bought this house that if you want to just go build it yourself would cost you 350, but I got it for 270 and the rents make sense and the cash on cash, this is, it's, 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 so I, I think that there's certainly opportunity. It just comes down to like having the eye for that. I don't have the eye for that, but it, you know, but I'm over here you know, analyzing stocks and like have eyes, like that's where I, you know, can have an eye for, but I'll let maybe, uh, Michael, you scratch my back. I'll scratch you and yeah. say what you do. <laughs> and moving towards in here, since, um, you're on time crunch. So you mentioned your last TikTok video, kind of your investing plans for 2023. What else is on the horizon uh, for you? Hmm. It's a good question. So I think what I really want to do a good job of in 2023 is use Every cool tax code, every cool write-off, deductible, all that fun stuff that the IRS affords freelancers. Real estate. Uh, so Ocho, yep. for example, a company I invested into. Yeah, I think you guys have heard of Teachable. It's um, it's, it's I used to host their Teachable. So okay, so Teachable's co-founder uh, on Kurt Nag Paul is my friend, and him and my other uh, there's like three co-founders, but him and Conrad sold them the business for like four hundred million dollars. And so this guy is saying, well. Uh, Conrad went to go build a kind of a QuickBooks alternative for content creators where Ankur went to go build Ocho.com. And what Ocho does is it allows freelancers, creators, and other people who work for themselves to begin investing toward a solo 401k. And instead of like having to go through a registered investment advisor and like do like the whole thing through Bank of America and like talk to it, like all this crazy stuff, he's like streamlined the process, made it very simple, very easy and gives you the flexibility to invest in really anything you want to invest into. That has opened my eyes to how I should definitely be taking advantage of that uh, in 2023. So I think a big theme for me is, and this goes back to that quant-based fund that, that we had launched, right? But like a big thing for me in 2023 is investing as much money that makes sense, right? Growth at a reasonable price. I, I just like wealth at a reasonable price and a reasonable just way to go about it. I, the last thing I want to do is like be... 90% or 100% invested and like something bad happened and not have the cash or the, you know, it's all my retirement. I can't pull, you know what I'm saying? But I, be as aggressive as humanly possible because I think 2023 is going to be, especially over the next six months, what we saw today, that 3% dip in the stock market, I think that is only the beginning. I think we're headed to a 2,900 to 3,300 range for the SPY. And that's another call it 18, 20% fall, right? And that's, that's truly a once in a decade, once in a multi-decade opportunity to to buy some some really good companies at a really good price. And I want to be as aggressive as possible while also being uh, responsible, if that makes sense. How do you suggest, or maybe in your mind, catch a falling knife, for lack of better terms? Stock market, let's say, is coming down at, let's say, every three months, it kind of drops 5%. A lot of people are like, get in now, buy as much as you can. It's like, do you, do you kind of dollar cost average into a recession as well? Because you never know technically when the bottom is. Sure, you could look at technicals all day long. You could you could read as much as you can. But do you have any suggestions, you know, maybe for novice investors that are like, you know, I want to invest during a recession. But for me, I remember when investing in the stock market, like at what point do I finally take that jump? And then a lot of people get cold feet, paralysis by analysis, never invest. Five years go by and the stock market's up 50%. And they're like, well, shit. Now it's too high and then they wait longer. You know what I'm saying? It's just like the waiting game. So it, do you have any suggestions to like kind of safely just dump some money in? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, I mean, that's the yeah dollar cost average into VOO, VTI, VGT, right? All your broad-based index funds, tech focused if you want with the VGT, because I know tech is sexy for a lot of people. Um, but I guess something that I'm doing very specifically is I'm looking for oversold long-term winners. Think companies like DocuSign, right? Trading at a valuation that they haven't traded at since like 2015. A company like DocuSign who recently just reported, it was a, I think a 27 or $28 million one-time expense. But if that expense wasn't there, they would have been operating income positive for the first time in company history, which is why their stock price popped like 18% after earnings. Finding companies like the DocuSigns, like the MongoDBs or or perhaps even Hims and Hers Health or even the smaller or larger companies like NVIDIA, right? There's a lot of companies out there that are these long-term winners, Snowflake, that have been oversold and the market is just like forgetting about because like, you know, the market is like a drunken psycho. He like gets really excited and it's like, you know, euphoria and then it's just like swing to the downside. Like, oh my gosh, I hate this, blah, blah, blah. And then everything just goes to shit. Right now, 
we did one of these. These were kind of coming up, but we're about to, in my opinion, you know, come back down to a, a really crazy time. But yeah, I that's that broad based index funds though, right? Dollar cost average. Not investing advice. If you're listening to this, I am not a registered investment advisor. Don't take anything I say uh, as gospel. I'm just a kid on the internet trying to build wealth. Yeah, well, he does have some good tips. Well, we could sit here and talk for hours. I know we're at time, Austin. Thanks so much for coming on, man. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. I learn something every time. Where can listeners find you? You know, how can listeners support you and what you're doing? But yeah, where's the best way to kind of find you and contact you? Um, So TikTok is where I post most of my content. You'll see me holding a pen and writing on a piece of paper more than likely. But I also have a Substack newsletter. Go to austinhankwitz.substack.com or you can go to rateofreturn.substack.com. That's the name of it, Rate of Return. And every Monday I share sort of, it's called the investing week ahead. Everything that we uh, are assuming will impact the markets in a good way or a bad way. Then every Sunday we summarize what really impacted the markets and my thoughts about them and how that might now trade or, or might change or not change my investing strategies or specific holdings with with other companies. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I got. It's awesome, man. Well, thanks again so much for coming to Austin. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Austin. Cool. Thanks, Elliot. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Love you guys. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Social Wealth Podcast. If you found value in this episode, do not hesitate to share it with somebody who needs to listen in. Be sure to follow us on social media at the Social Wealth Podcast. If you haven't already, be sure to like this video and subscribe so you don't miss another episode. Thanks for tuning in. Until the next one.